What does Castle Howard, Pigs, Scotland, and France have in common? Encore une fois, another episode of Bridgerton. Cheerio, everyone. Good day to you all. This is Dee, movie man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today I am coming to you all with another episode of Bridgerton, Season 1, Episode 6, Swish. This episode was directed by Julie Ann Robinson, who also directed our premiere episode. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode seeing the newlywed Duke and Duchess of Hastings arriving to their new home, Cliveden Castle. And I actually have a little fun fact about that. If you guys have been watching, you know that I love doing research. So I did a little digging and I found out that this castle is located in Yorkshire. Its actual name is Castle Howard. It is 300 years old and it was built by a descendant of Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk. And if you guys have been watching these recaps, then you know that I love all things history. I love learning about specific eras and time, the culture, the aesthetics, the costumes, society, all of that. And the Duke of Norfolk is a very prolific figure in regards to the Tudor dynasty and Henry VIII and his six wives. And I have been a huge Tudor history buff ever since I saw The Other Boleyn Girl back in 2008 and then the Showtime series, The Tudors, starring Jonathan Rhys Myers. And from there, I've watched so many shows. I've read so many books. I have watched and consumed so much that's Tudor related. I could literally probably sit here and run down the amount of things I know about the Tudor dynasty, about the War of the Roses, about Henry VII about the House of York, the House of Lancaster, Prince Arthur, Catherine of Aragon, and then Henry VIII and the rest of his wives. There's a whole lot I could tell you guys about that. But as far as the Duke of Norfolk, he factors into that history, primarily because he was the uncle to two of Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, who, if you guys didn't know, were both tragically beheaded by order of the king himself. So yeah, I thought it was really cool to discover that connection, but moving on. So as I said, the Duke and Duchess are arriving to Clydeman Castle. It is massive. Daphne is introduced to the household staff, including Mrs. Coulson. She has all these plans for them as far as dinner and touring the estate, but all that is going to have to wait because the Duke has other plans with the Duchess. And I think we all know what that means. Lady Whistledown mentions that although the Duke and Duchess will be very much missed back in London, perhaps they'll return soon bearing a surprise. And uh, speaking of surprises, the Bridgertons are very much surprised when Colin suddenly announces his engagement to Marina. Anthony, of course, is not pleased at all. No surprises there. His first assumption is that Colin must have compromised Marina. But no, he's just a man in love. And Anthony's like, see, this is why we should have just taken you to the brothel so you could have sown your wild oats because here you are proposing to the first woman who tickles your fancy. And Colin fires right back. He's like, well, it's not my fault. You're incapable of true attachment. Ooh, touche. But in the end, of course, Anthony is not willing to give his blessing. But is that going to stop Colin? Doubtful. We hit our title credit and we jump back over to the Duke and Duchess, who have just finished christening their new bedroom. And although it looks like the Duke is ready for another round, Daphne decides to cut things short and head off for a tour with Mrs. Colson. So as they're on the tour and Miss Colson is explaining all these different aspects of the castle, Daphne is also giving her feedback as far as what she would change and some adjustments she wants to make and a lot of the things her mother has told her. And you can see that Miss Colson is not feeling it. She's just kind of like, eh. She wants to say something, but she doesn't. And you can really see the hint of irritation on her face. At one point, they stop on a staircase and they see a portrait of the former Duchess of Hastings, Simon's mother. And as they both look at the portrait, Miss Colson says that she was very much the perfect duchess. And then she gives Daphne a side eye and she's like, and then keeps walking. I was like, oh no. <laughs> if it wasn't clear enough, Miss Colson is not here for the new duchess. Miss Colson also shows Daphne the nursery, which is still quite the bone of contention because unfortunately, no children was part of the deal. We then see Simon and Daphne at dinner, and although Daphne is doing her best to adhere to the formality of the setup and the table of everything, Simon is just like, uh, no, you can come sit down here. You're too far away. Like, this is our home. Like, we don't have to adhere to all these rules. And you can see that all the servants and Miss Colson are not feeling that. But there's only so much time for dinner because there are personal matters to attend to. And so they go running outside on the lawn. It starts to rain. And pretty soon, the two of them are doing what they do best. 
And I was like, okay, you know, I've learned to expect this, but no, it does not stop with the rain scene. As a matter of fact, the whole sequence we see next is like a game of Clue. First position, in the bedroom. Second position, in the library. Third position, in broad daylight on the front lawn. I was like, <laughs> I mean, geez, and I had heard that this show was going to like push the boundaries a little bit as far as sensuality and, you know, even a little bit of sexuality, but uh, I clearly see <laughs> that this is the bulk of those scenes. I was like, alrighty then. Well, they do call it a honeymoon for a reason. Then over at the Featheringtons, we can see that things are still very tense between Penelope and Marina. Marina is trying her best to smooth things over, but Penelope is being very cold and very passive aggressive. She's like, look, I would never do anything to expose you or bring scandal on our family, but I cannot bring myself to condone your actions. And even more so considering how Penelope feels about Colin. So over at the Modiste, we see the Viscountess and Eloise, and it's a very important day. It is time for Eloise's hymns to be lowered. And culturally, that was the visual representation from a young girl moving into womanhood and venturing out into society. Lady Featherington and Marina arrive also, and there's a little bit of an awkward run-in with Eloise and her mother, but the Viscountess is very kind to Marina, and we can see that she's still very uncomfortable with how things are progressing. Lady Featherington takes the initiative to ask about them all sitting down to a formal dinner with the Viscountess, Colin, and the Viscount. And Lady Featherington speaks to the modiste about getting new gowns for Marina, and she quickly lets her know, um, your money is looking a little funny, so no, that's not gonna work. But aha, Marina comes through and she has some questions for the modiste. You know, you have a very unique accent and I've never asked you what part of France you're from. And then she starts speaking in French. She's like, yeah, my mother was French. So I'm really not fooled by your little act. And I would hate for the other ladies to find out that they've been employing a fraud all this time. And then she switches back to English and she looks at Lady Featherington and she's like, you know, something tells me that the modiste will be much more amenable to our current request. And then she looks at the modiste. The modiste is like, très bon. And Marina says the same, très bon, and walks away. I was like, you better come through, Marina. <laughs> and of course, we know that Madame Delacroix, the modiste, we know that she's not French. However, the whole allure of her being French is that the best dressmakers come from France. They were very pivotal and ahead of the game as far as fashion. So naturally that has a huge impact on the demand for her dresses, which keeps her in business. So if everyone were to suddenly find out that they've been scammed, it would not be pretty. So the modiste knows what time it is. Time to play ball. Back in Cliveden, we see a fair going on over in the village, and there is a contest for the villager that has the best pig. Daphne is supposed to make the decision, but when she realizes that the pig is going to be slaughtered, she's like, oh, well, all three pigs should win. And you can see all the villagers are just like, no one understands why she did that, but Daphne is very pleased with herself. So afterwards, Daphne is walking through the village when suddenly a young toddler who is crying and upset runs up to her. Daphne picks her up and she's comforting her and just trying to figure out, you know, where her mother is. And then a moment later, a very flustered pregnant woman named Joanna rushes up. And upon realizing that she's speaking to the Duchess, she attempts to curtsy. And Daphne is like, no, 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 please don't do that. Not in your condition. And things get very awkward for a moment because Simon is also there and he is very aware of Daphne's connection with the child and just how well she's able to nurture the child. Daphne is also aware of this, so she quickly gives the child, whose name is Ada, back to her mother and they venture off. Simon and Daphne have a brief conversation about that later. Daphne was just mainly worried that it would pain Simon to see her with children. And of course, Simon was thinking the same for Daphne. Being around children just takes away a lot of her own worries and concerns. And she's a natural caretaker because of all her brothers and sisters. But the great part is pretty soon they'll all go off, marry and have their own children. And pretty soon we'll have all the screaming, crying infants we could possibly want to help take care of. Later, we see the Featheringtons and the Bridgertons sitting down to dinner. The conversation is going well for the most part. Lady Featherington suggests that an overseas honeymoon would be ideal. And so would having a wedding much sooner than later. But Anthony is not going for it. He's like, I think a long engagement is just fine. Afterwards, we are treated to an excruciating performance by Prudence, who is singing about as off-key as one person can get. 
Penelope sees Colin excuse himself and leave the room. She does the same and she rushes after him. And it's pretty clear that she's about to spill the beans. And I was just like, man, Penelope, I understand what you're going through. I understand the struggle, but I just, oh, please don't go down this road. So in the end, she does mention George and the letters and Marina and that whole entanglement. However, she does not mention the pregnancy. And Colin is not concerned with that. He's like, listen, I've flirted with all kinds of girls. I've had all kinds of attachments, but it doesn't matter because Marina is the one I love. She's the one I'm going to marry. So thank you for your concern, but we're good. And once again, Penelope's efforts have backfired. Then Marina and Colin have a conversation and they both agree that they could be married in a matter of days if they were to travel to Scotland. Colin says, just give me a day and we'll be on our way. And for more reasons than one, Marina is immensely overjoyed. Later, we see Daphne helping Rose pick flowers from the garden. And once again, Miss Colson doesn't understand what Daphne is doing. She's like, we have a staff to assist you with that. And for Daphne, she's like, oh, I don't have a problem like helping and assisting. Like she doesn't see what the big deal is. And the issue really is that Miss Colson is used to tradition and structure, whereas Daphne is really here to shake things up and do things differently. So basically, Miss Colson represents the past and Daphne represents the future. And whenever you have that kind of dynamic, there's always going to be some conflict there. Later, we see Daphne and Rose out in the village and they have gathered all the flowers to help prepare these gift baskets for the villagers. But as Daphne is trying to pass them out, they're all like, mm-mm, mm-mm. they're like ignoring her. They're just not feeling her. So clearly something is going on. Then all of a sudden, Daphne hears, yo, Grace. <laughs> It is, of course, little Ada, and she runs up and gives Daphne a hug, and her mother, Joanna, is not far behind. So Daphne offers Joanna one of the baskets. She can't carry it because she's pregnant and she's already carrying too many things, so Daphne's like, you know what? We'll just walk with you, which is good because it gives Daphne a chance to ask Joanna what's going on with the villagers. And Joanna just lets her know, well, listen, that whole thing you did where you said all three pigs won? Well, the tradition is that the winner of that contest is able to supply pork to Cliveden for the next year. So when you didn't choose anybody, that meant no one got that opportunity. So Daphne, of course, didn't realize that, but she hopes to rectify that very soon. And then we see Daphne having a conversation with Miss Colson, and we can see that Daphne is trying to make peace. She just wants to get along with Miss Colson and just see how they can come together and collaborate to really make the most of Cliveden Castle. And Miss Colson is pretty open. She even tells her some of the Duke's history with his mother and his father and just how difficult his childhood and upbringing has been. Over the Featheringtons, Penelope ends up discovering the whole forgery with her mother and George's letters. She lets Marina know, but for Marina, nothing has really changed. She's like, that's fine, but he still abandoned me and he still never responded back to me. And of course, Penelope is still trying to dissuade her, but then Marina figures it out. Oh, you have feelings for Colin. And she quickly brings Penelope into reality by saying that your love for him is an unrequited fantasy. Ooh, he sees you as a young girl while he sees me for the woman I am. And ultimately, I have to make the best decision for me and my child, even if it hurts your feelings. Oof, bitter pill to swallow. Later, Daphne meets up with Simon in the study, and once again, they are getting it in. Position four, in the study, on the desk. I was just like, man, they really made their sex quota for this episode. I mean, I just look, (laughs) I'm just saying. But what's really interesting this time is that Daphne is more aware of how Simon disengages from sex. Like he kind of like, you know, jumps over and then he kind of is doing something that she's not aware of. And then it's like, oh, okay, now I'm good. Now this, of course, in real life is called the pullout method. And that method has never made any sense to me, but I guess for some men it works. But the issue is the pullout method is done to prevent pregnancy. And if the dude can't have children, then... You see where I'm going with this? So Daphne goes to Rose and she asks her, look, I need to know how a woman comes to be with child and please spare no details. So afterwards, we see that Daphne is in a very emotional haze. She is very disconnected. She is just very off emotionally. So when she meets up with the Duke, it is business as usual and they are having their usual encounter. However, this time Daphne decides to switch it up and she jumps on top of him and she is aggressively riding him. And at some point he kind of becomes aware like, hey, I'm about to, but he's also kind of caught up in the moment. But before he can kind of say anything, he has, 
And we can see that Daphne has this very stoic, very cold expression on her face. And I was just like, so, uh, salt? Is that where we're going with this? I get that they probably tried to blur the lines there with him kind of getting caught up, but there was a clear like, no, this isn't what I want to do. And it obviously wasn't his plan. And then she still, I was just like, oh no, we're not going there. Ooh, but let me not get off track. So Daphne hops off of Simon and she's about to leave the room. And Simon is just like, what did you just do? And Daphne, of course, was hoping this was not the case, but now she sees what's really going on. The jig is up. You lied to me. You told me you couldn't have children. You didn't tell me you didn't want to have children. Not the same thing. She feels like he has taken her future and thrown it away. And he lets her know that I would have died to keep that from happening. But then you convinced me that this would be enough, that I would be enough. And Daphne just says like, you've tricked me, you've lied to me, you've humiliated me, and that's not love. And I was like, well, uh, I don't think assault is either, but I digress. And then we hear Lady Whistledown saying that all is fair in love and war, but there are some battles that leave no victor, only a trail of broken hearts, which leaves one to wonder if the price is ever worth the fight. We see Penelope go to Eloise and they finally reconcile. She breaks down and Eloise is there to comfort her. And then as Marina and Colin prepare to embark on their new life together, we realize that Lady Whistledown has discovered Marina's pregnancy. And worse, now everybody knows. And that closes out episode six, Swish. I don't even know what to say. Like, there is so much that happened on this episode. There were so many twists and turns and things I was not expecting. I was just like, oh. <laughs> like, I figured I knew where certain things were progressing with all these characters, but this one took me by surprise. I was just like, <sighs> like I said earlier, I was really shocked at where they went with Simon and Daphne because I understand that the dynamics might seem different, but that is still very much a violation. It would be just as messed up the other way around. And this is just like, how do you come back from that? I'm just like, oh no. I mean, cheating is one thing, or I don't know, there could be so many other situations, but a situation like that, that just hits just a little bit harder. So I cannot imagine how they're gonna come back from that. And I had a feeling, I just knew that Marina's plan wasn't going to work, although I was rooting for her. I'm like, there's no way she's gonna succeed. And we see that, you know, it is all blown up in her face. And it's not even just her who was gonna deal with the fallout, but all these other characters who are connected. So I'm just like, whoo, this next episode is really gonna be something. And I cannot wait to see it. So once again, this is D, Movie Man, signing off. And I'll see you at the movie. Thank you.